chapter 29 through 11, chapter 29 through 12, 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became might in war, and put foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain better res resurrection. Others suffered mocking, flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sown in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, without us, be made perfect. Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat on the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. in which he called for the dieter 
to drink as much vinegar daily as possible along with one cup of tea and one raw egg. As we might expect, Byron was known to be both anorexic and bulimic. <laughs> but his dangerous diet actually became quite popular with people in his time. But here's the last one. It's my favorite. It is called the Graham Diet. And it was invented by Sylvester Graham, a 19th century Presbyterian minister who believed that people were fat because they had too much sex. <laughs> True. A vegetarian, Graham's diet of veggies and abstinence did not catch on with the public at large. But, here's what's really interesting. He later did contribute something to the food world that we still eat today. The graham cracker. He invented that. So, next time you eat a graham cracker, remember that you have a sexually abstinent vegetarian Presbyterian minister to thank for that. World is strange, isn't it? Weird diets, such as the ones I just named, would not exist if we did not think that losing unhealthy weight was important, while at the same time acknowledging that losing unhealthy weight is difficult. And it is. Most nutritionists agree with why it is so difficult for people to lose weight. And we certainly are familiar, most of us, with their list. This is just a few examples, like there are no quick fixes when it comes to diet. Or our bodies work against us. Metabolism. Or fad diets. Fad diets may have a temporary effect, but they don't last. Or one diet simply doesn't fit all because our bodies are so different from each other. And of course there are others as well. But the greatest inhibitor for losing unhealthy weight is one that every nutritionist and physician and dieter will acknowledge even though often we don't want to. Losing unhealthy weight is not based upon a diet, but a change in lifestyle. Go to the doctor. Go to the nutritionist. They will tell you that. It takes a total change in lifestyle. Even if a diet will lose temporary pounds, you put them right back on if you don't change inside. Because that's how you change outside. And the writer of Hebrews would agree with that conclusion. But only in regards to losing unhealthy spiritual rather than physical weight. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not without us He's talking about the church without us. Be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the sake of the joy 
that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, we often look to examples, alive or dead, for inspiration and understanding when we're trying to deal with or overcome a problem. Examples help us, don't they? The late Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood has recently emerged in our very cynical and very divided culture as an example of one who taught unity and compassion, community and gentleness of spirit, qualities which we perceive as absent from the politics and the religion and the general culture of our time. Last year's film, Fred Rogers' Life, astounded Hollywood. They were unexpected, not expecting this, when it became the 12th most profitable documentary in movie history. But it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When we compare his life and his message to the times in which we live today. We need that message, don't we? We need Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. That same kind of idea about having an example can be said for the writer of Hebrews as that writer shares examples of faith and courage from the Old Testament, from the Jewish Scriptures. The most likely writer of the book of Hebrews was the Apostle Paul. We can say that with almost absolute certainty. And his most likely audience was probably Jewish Christians who had yet to fully embrace the Christian life. Now, why was that the case? Well, while these Jewish Christians certainly viewed Jesus as the long-promised Messiah, they did so from a strictly Judaic point of view. Christians who had completely embraced the new church, most of them being Gentiles, by the way, were beginning to experience persecution. While the Jewish Christians of Paul's audience provided both sympathy and assistance to those Christians who were being persecuted, they were very reluctant, and we can't blame them, they were reluctant to completely give up the safety of their Jewish religious roots because Judaism, as we know, was protected in the Roman Empire. So they kept that connection. while still being a part of the Christian church. And Paul is, Paul who completely has become the Christian in the life of the church, himself being persecuted, is very disturbed by this. Or let's say the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews describes this hesitancy to remain within the same confines of Jewish legalism as a weight that is a burden that is blocking these Jewish Christians from having the kind of faith that Christ came to give to those who believe in Him. Knowing that His readers are steeped in stories about the heroes of the Old Testament, Paul provides, as we heard, an extensive list of examples. Many of them familiar to us because we learned about them in Sunday school. We know those names. But for us and for the non-Jewish Christians of Paul's time, those stories of courage and faith serve one purpose. To show how God finally rewarded all faith in the sending of the Messiah and His sacrificial death upon the cross. And how we are to pick up our crosses and follow the Lord. That doesn't sound 
real heroic, does it? Sounded scary then. Sounds scary now. In the historic tradition of the Jewish religion, the Messiah was a heroic figure who would appear to the world as a conquering David, a rebellious Moses, a prophetic Samuel, or an Elijah. But Hebrews does not call Jesus a hero. Rather, the Messiah, as described by Hebrews, is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The pioneer, not the hero. Pioneer. The mighty cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament of which Hebrews speaks is not so much an example of courage, although what they did was courageous, but an example of futility because in spite of their courage, in spite of their faith, in spite of their heroism, these religious leaders, not one of them, quote, received what they were promised. They did not receive it, that is, until the Son of God came and died and rose again to set God's seal upon the messianic identity and to assure everyone for all time that through faith, faith in the Messiah, faith in the Son, they would receive the Father's promise of forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life. In C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, his foundational book about how he converted from, from, from atheism to Christianity, he talks about the absolute surrender of self that is essential to having faith in Christ. He talks about setting aside all those things that weigh down our lives and keep us from total dependency upon the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And he says it with these words. Your real new self, which is Christ and also yours, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for Him. Does that sound strange? The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, and loneliness and despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find Him. And with Him, everything else thrown in. What Lewis is describing as faith in Christ is not an avoidance of particular sins. That was the legalism of ancient Judaism where following the religious law was the only way to have a right relationship with God. But just as maintaining a healthy weight is based upon a physical way of life, only in embracing the life of faith as taught to us by Christ do we discover that spiritual way of life that God intended for us in the sending of God's Son. So according to Hebrews, what is that weight or those weights that through faith in Christ we are able to set aside. Well, I shared a few of them a moment ago when I spoke to our younger members. 
It is the weight of doubt replaced by a blessed assurance in God's love. Now, everybody doubts. Doubt is part of life. It's part of being human. We doubt. And sometimes we struggle with our doubt. But sometimes you just got to stop doubting. And believe. And let faith come. The weight of doubt. Then there's the weight of guilt. We all know about that, don't we? Guilt. Heavy. A weight of guilt that is to be replaced by the endless and unconditional grace that Jesus provides for us whenever we ask of it. It's always there. It never stops pouring down upon us. The weight of doubt, the weight of guilt, the weight of selfishness. So easy for us to, to carry that. Replaced by the selfless service that is the very essence of discipleship. Service that fills up our hearts and fills up our souls and fills up our lives by letting us give of ourselves to others. That's how we set aside the weight of selfishness. The weight of fear. Fear. Replaced by trust. A trust that God has a purpose for our lives no matter what we may face. Sometimes things just don't make sense. And we just can't make sense of them. So what do we do? We trust. We don't fear. We trust. We take that trust given to us by God and we use it to love each other, to love our Lord. All of these burdens that I just named, doubt, guilt, selfishness, fear, all of these burdens and so many more, we surrender when we allow our divine pioneer to lead us not as an example that we can kind of look at and emulate, but to actually lead us into the kingdom of God. We follow. We follow. And Christ takes us there. So what is weighing us down this morning? What is weighing down your heart? What pointless burdens do we carry when freedom is no more than a prayer away. This morning we are all invited to change our lifestyles and lose some unhealthy weight. Not the kind of weight that kills the body, but the weight that kills our hopes, the weight that blinds us to the needs of others. Only Christ's love is strong enough to lift that load from our lives. And when we let Christ do that in being lightened, we become enlightened and set on the path that Christ has forged for us. This morning that path is waiting for us, you and I, to take, to follow because we know where it leads. We know that at the end of that path, Christ is waiting for us to welcome us into His eternal love. It's time for us, all of us, to look at our hearts and lose some weight. Our hymn this morning is number 700.